Shalom, shalom, Israel. We back at it again. Another Monday. So, first of all, I want to give all honor, praise, and glory to the Elohim, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Holy One of Israel, who is Jesus. So, this particular topic, <clears throat> this particular topic is a very controversial topic. And we, we're going to dive into this today, right? Um, and why we're going to dive into this is because I always felt like there was a gap between what they call the radical Israelites versus what they call the moderate Israelites. And to be quite honest, the reason why they say that is because on one end, the moderates believe that the other nations can be saved. The radical Israelites believe that the nations, other nations cannot be saved and only Israel can be saved, right? So that's why they classify the two. That's really the only reason why they classify the two, right? So we have an issue here because this bridge, this gap, is causing all this division between Israel. And what's funny is it's causing all this division, yet we have a common enemy. Now, one of the other, one of the controversial, main controversial topics is about Esau, right? Who he is, uh, 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 and and what is going to happen to him, right? So, radicals think Esau is the white man. Blanket statement. Straight up the white man. The moderates know, which we, we what they both uh, agree on, know that Esau is the people that's pretending to be the Jews in the land, Right? And the radicals believe in that too, but then they believe that the white man in, in, in totality is Esau, right? Now, there does not need to be any division between this because Esau, guess what? Esau hates moderate Israelites. Esau hates radical Israelites, right? And no, you cannot make a blanket statement, a blanket statement. Understand what I'm saying, y'all, right? There are white Edomites, right? And there can very well be black Edomites, but we're not going to get into all of that. would take too much time. My point is, is that you cannot make blanket statements on either side, right? You can't. But then on one end, you cannot forget that Esau hates Israel, and guess what? God hates Esau. Now, a lot of folks will be like, what, what do you mean he hates Esau? Like, if you're not used to hearing that, God hates? Yeah, he hates Esau, right? We're going to see why he hates Esau, right? And that's what the lesson is going to be today. It's going to be called the pride of Esau, the bridge between moderate and radical Israelites, right? The pride of Esau, the bridge between moderate and radical Israelites, because we got to get down to this, right? Because it's brothers uh, who they would term one West. I know a lot of these brothers, right? And... What I tell people all the time, yeah, your doctrine may be different. They might have a more radical perception, right, on um, um, on the Bible, as far as the interpretation of, of the Bible. But we can't allow this to cause division if we all have the same spirit to love one another and to make it in the kingdom and follow Christ and obey the law, statutes, and commandments of the God of Israel. We cannot have this division. Nobody, 
And I mean, nobody is going to agree fully on everything. Even people that go to a certain camp, you're a fool to think that you're going to agree with everything. You may not say it, but you, in your mind, you don't agree with everything your camp teaches. Doesn't matter if you're radical, doesn't matter if you're moderate. You don't agree with everything your camp teaches, right? So with that being said, we should not have any division amongst us, especially when we have a common enemy, y'all. Right now, let me make this disclaimer uh, before I get into this. Right. This is not talking about any individuals. I don't care what nationality you come from. If you are following the law, statutes and commandments of the most high God, then you can avoid the lake of fire. Bottom line. Right. Bottom line. You can avoid the lake of fire if you follow the law, statutes, commandments of the most high God. However, the nation of Esau, the nation itself, come on, man, y'all can read this book and see he pretty much is through, right? There ain't no saving Esau. There really ain't no saving Esau. Remember what I said, though? I'm not talking about individuals, but when it comes to Esau, the whole Ain't no saving Esau. So on one end, let's come to some type of agreement. On one end, even though y'all think only Israel gonna make it, ain't no really, ain't no saving Esau. On the other end, though y'all think, or we know, because I'm, I would be categorized to be on the moderate side, right? Even though I kind of embody both but I would be kind of more so on the moderate side, right? But we have to acknowledge also that ain't no win for Esau as a nation. He's through, right? So we're going to get into this and it's a very logical explanation for why he is through. So we don't have to keep bumping heads over this situation when we both have this enemy that hates us both, hates both sides, right? We're going to start this at Genesis, the 25th chapter, because we got to get down to the bottom of this, right? Feelings don't matter with this. The book says what it says, right? So let's start this at Genesis, the 25th chapter. Genesis, the 25th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 21. Genesis, the 25th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 21. Verse 21 reads, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Verse 23, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Now, we can see, because people focus on this when it comes to race, right? It says that two manner of people shall be separated from from thy bowels, two nations, two manner of people, right? They're going to be two different nations because these folks came out of the same parents, but one of them was going to be and end up in Mount Seir. The other one is going to end up uh, f further up as far as in the land of Canaan, right? So two different nations, two different countries, right? with two different mannerisms of people. They think differently. They their, their whole outlook on life is different. All of that. But they are not um, literally, <laughs> they are not literally two different races of people, if you get what I'm saying, right? They come from the same parents. They just ended up being two, uh, two different nations with 
two different mannerisms, right? Let us continue. Um, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So this was already a prophecy that was being foretold before these two boys was even born. Y'all get what I'm saying? So two uh, nations are in the womb, two manner of people within that will, shall be separated from the bowels. One, um, um, one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elders shall serve the younger. Already showing that Esau was going to serve Jacob. Right? Let us continue. Verse 24. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like a like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. Now, for all y'all that think that that is talking about that or, or or that's specifying that this is the white man, go to a courtroom. I, 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 <laughs> I want. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to show the stuff that I don't believe, but I'm going to show the stuff where I'm in the middle of, where I'm understanding of, right? But I don't completely agree. If I go into a court of law, y'all, and the judge tells me, prove that this is the white man. And I come in and I'm like, well, your honor, he was red all over like a hairy garment. How is that proving that he's the white man? Because even if you use the concordance, which is what some of the brothers I know use, it still says that the meaning of the word still shows that his complexion would be Rudy, like David, right? He would be a light-skinned brother, not a white man. Because it says he's red all over like a hairy garment. Then uh, another reason why they say that this is showing that it's the white man is because the red is coming from the blood showing through the skin of the white man. Y'all are reaching. You're reaching. And, and um, with this, uh, uh, I also want to make this disclaimer. That this is twofold. This is a twofold lesson as far as the meaning of it, right? It says the pride of Esau. So we'll be discussing Esau's actual pride, and then we'll be discussing the brothers that hate Esau and their pride. Y'all got to humble yourself, right? Now I know my Israelite brothers and sisters can humble themselves. I'm not worried about Esau humbling himself, right? And even if um um a few individuals from that nation come and, and try to keep the law, statutes, commandments. I'm not turning nobody down. If you want to avoid the lake of fire, then by all means, if you want to learn these law, statutes, commandments to avoid the lake of fire, by all means, I'm going to teach you. Right? But I'm not worried about saving Esau. You see what I'm saying? Nobody's worried about saving Esau. He's pretty much done, right? As far as a nation. Let us continue. Um, verse 26. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare him. So Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah bore Esau, right? Or bore, uh, uh, bore the boys in general. Verse 27, and the boys grew, and Esau was a cunting hunter, a man of the field, and, Jake's, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. <laughs> Look, I'll never forget when I heard an elder describe like Jacob, and it's, it's funny that we know that Jacob is, we are, we're, we're the children of Jacob and the children of Israel, and when he said... <laughs> When he said that Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents, he ended up saying 
um, um, like, like, like if you go out and you, uh, ask, well, where you going, bro? Where you going up? Man, I'm going to chill at the crib, man. <laughs> I start cracking up when I heard that. But that's true. Like, we're, you, uh, Jacob is a plain man, and he dwelt in tents. Israel loved chilling at the crib. You see what I'm saying? Unless it's a pandemic, and they telling them they got to stay in the crib. Uh, 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 and, you know, we, we hate doing what people tell us to do. You see what I'm saying? But anyway. That's besides the point. Let us continue. Verse 28. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob, right? So Isaac loved Esau because he um, 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 he did eat of his venison, right? And Isaac, I mean, uh, Esau, was, uh, Esau was not hesitant to go out there and bring back Isaac's favorite meal, which would be the venison, right? So they shared a commonality. So he loved his son, right? And he was, once again, he was a cunning hunter, right? That is going to follow in his, as far as his history um, all the way down until now. He was a cunning, he was a cunning hunter, right? And we're going to see what he lived by as that cunning hunter. So Esau was the cunning hunter and Jacob was the plain man chilling at the crib, right? So let us continue. Verse 29. And Jacob sawed pottage and Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore, his name was called Edom, right? Now, I can, I can only imagine when we, when we go down further, I can only imagine just how long, and I mean, in short span of time, just how long he actually was hungry. Because, man, if you, if you were sitting here in 10 hours, I know we got to eat, right? But if 10 hours went by and you about ready to faint and die, 10 hours, right, that you will give up the birthright and the blessings of God, you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. But we already know that this prophecy had to be fulfilled, right? It's just how it was fulfilled. It could have been anything else. It had to be some bread pottage, some soup. Some soup, that's how petty it was, right? Let's continue. Um, verse 31, and Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. Now, let's understand that it says, sell, sell me this day thy birthright. He did not steal the birthright, y'all. And, 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 and with these people out here saying that, uh, uh, Esau, saying that the birthright was stolen from the father, Originally, that is a lie. That is a lie straight out of hell, right? He did not uh, He did not steal. He sold his birthright for some soup. Yeah, he didn't want to put that out there. You, you want to tell people that he stole it because you know how petty it is to sell the blessings of God for some red pottage, right? Verse 32, and Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. Really? You at a point to die? I just want to know how many days went by. I bet you that was the same day, right? Uh, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swear unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. We got to make this dramatic, right? Bread and red pottage of lentils, right? For the blessings of God, right? Uh, uh, what did he say? What prophet shall this birthright? <laughs> what profit shall this birthright do to me? He did not acknowledge what he got. 
Y'all see that? That's why you have to acknowledge when God gives you a blessing. Why? Because you can turn his hate on you. If you don't acknowledge it and then you just go to the left, right? You can get you can get to the point where he will hate you. We got to come out of this fairy tale mindset where God loves everybody. He don't. You got to keep the commandments to get his love, right? Um, let us continue. We're going to go now to Genesis, the 27th chapter. Genesis, the 27th chapter. Now, mind you, this man sold his birthright once again for some soup, for some red pottage of lentils and bread, and despised the birthright that he was given, right? Let's see what he, let's see what he gave up. Because this don't make no sense to me. The prophecy had to be fulfilled, yes. But he still chose that. He still chose it. You choose what part of prophecy you're going to be on, right? It was going to get to him regardless, though. Let us go to Genesis, the 27th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 28. Genesis, the 27th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 28. Now, this is Isaac giving the blessings um, onto Jacob, right? Now, let's see what he gave up, Esau. Let's see what he gave up. Verse 28, therefore, God giveth thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee. Now, let's, let's get into that, right? Because we don't want to necessarily focus on, I know, on the moderate side, right? Because we're going to do both. On the moderate side, we don't necessarily want to focus on the nations serving Israel, right? Because we're going to rule the whole world with Christ, right? That's true. The nations will serve Israel, right? But we're not looking at it the same way right? We rule over you. If you keep the law, statutes, and commandments, you can still be treated like a person that was born as a native Israelite. This is in the law, right? But we, we, we can't get out of the fact that the nations is part of the blessings, y'all. It's part of the blessings. It says, let people serve thee. This is what Isaac told Jacob. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. This will happen, right? Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Now, I want y'all to keep that as a mental note, right? Because people follow this. Even unto this day, if they really know who you are, for instance, like the Quakers, they blessed you because they knew that they would be blessed. If they cursed you, they knew that they were going to be cursed. These nations out here are not stupid, right? But once again, let's go back to the fact that even though we don't want to focus on it, because you got to get to the first resurrection, you have to make sure you get salvation and that you won't be a castaway while you focused on people serving you, right? That should not be on your mind. However, we're not going to ignore that it's in here, right? This is what Isaac said. This is with the blessings of God. Obviously, God understands this, right? Let us continue. Um, verse 30, and it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father. Look, just like a, just like a Jake, right? Soon as we get what we coming from, we gone, right? We straight gone. Uh, let us continue that. Uh, 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 that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting, right? Because Esau went out there to hunt and get Isaac his favorite meal with the venison. And he tried to be sneaky, 
by selling his birthright, but then on the low, I sold this to you. So now I'm finna get the money, right, that you gave me for the birthright, and then I'm gonna try to get the birthright. That's some scan that's scandalous, right? This is the mannerisms of Esau, though, right? The scandalism, right? Um, let us continue. Verse 31, and he also made savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, let my father arise and eat and his son's venison that thy soul may be, may bless thee, right? Bless me. Verse 32, and Isaac, his father said unto him, who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly like Wait a minute. I, I was just with Esau. My son just left. You know what I'm saying? Who is this? Right? Uh, and it says, Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it to brought it me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest and have blessed them, yea. And he shall be blessed, right? So he can't take this back, right? He didn't already bless uh, 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 Jacob. So he can't give that same blessing to Isaac. You see what I'm saying? Prophecy fulfilled, regardless. And that should also show y'all that no matter what, somebody could be sneaky. Somebody can be trying to go contrary to the will of God. But somewhere along the line, Either that person's gonna be informed to act and get what they're rightfully um 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 what they're rightfully uh chosen to get, or something gonna happen to you where you're not gonna be able to get it. You see how God works? That no matter what, even within our free will, if my free will is going against his plan, he's going to he's going to redirect it, right? He will redirect it. So let, let's be mindful of that, right? Verse 34, and when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, thy brother came with subtlety and have taken away thy blessing. So this is what, uh, uh, um, this is what Esau had said right? But how can he say this, right? How can Esau even, even, even come to the, the, the mindset to say that my brother used subtlety to get this birthright from me? He didn't. You sold your birthright for some red pottage lint in, of lentils and some bread. So that is what you felt, and that's how you felt about God. That is what your faith, that is how your faith was to the God of Israel, right? That you will sell your birthright for some soup. You know how people will sell their soul, right? So basically, he sold his soul for some soup. And y'all wondering why the Lord hates him? That ain't the only reason. There's going to be other reasons. But y'all wonder why the Lord say he hate him? Right? Let us continue. Um, verse 36. And he said, is not he? I'm, I'm sorry. Skip down to verse 38. Verse 38. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live and shall serve thy brother. Right? You see that? You shall serve your brother. And indeed he did. Right? And he will. He will continue to do that, right? But, uh, let's keep going. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the, the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck, right? And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. 
And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will slay my brother. Now, the actual brothers, they made up, right? And a lot of people don't mention that. Eventually, they made up. Esau's anger towards his brother eventually went away. They came together. They made up. They was brothers again. They got along again. But his children carried on that hatred, right? Now, Isaac told him that the fatness of the earth was going to be, the, the dwelling place shall be the fatness of the earth, right? And you shall live by the sword, right? Cunning hunter living by the sword. That is how he got his riches, his glory, his fame, whatever you call it. He got it by being a cunning hunter with the sword, y'all. Then it says when he when he when he shall have dominion that uh that he shall break his yoke off of his neck talking about his brother's yoke. We're going to show when that actually happened, right? We're going to get into that. Now, here's something else that we are going to get into, right? One of Esau's uh, uh children or more specifically grandchildren really went out of the way to uh, 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 show the hatred of Esau with us, right? So who is that? Who is that child? We're going to find out who that is. There's a lot of things in here that if you don't really go in here and if you don't really be honest with yourself, you're going to miss these things, right? Um, You're, you're, you're really going to miss these things, right? And even though you have one side focusing on uh, uh, one part of it. It makes the other side not want to focus on it as much. Why? Because with these beliefs over here, we're trying to get everybody, all the sons and daughters of Adam, back to the fold, back to the God of Israel, back to Christ. Over here, right, we got moderate, we got radical. Over here, they're not worried about that, right? So they're more uh, uh, focused on the being slaves, uh, God hating Esau, Esau being utterly destroyed, you know, all of them, right? No individual matter, right? But regardless of the beliefs, y'all, we have a common enemy. And I hope that eventually... People can come together and deal with our commonalities instead of letting these things be um, be things that cause division between us, right? Because as an Israelite, any way it goes, y'all shouldn't be arguing about who can be saved or who can't be saved. We're, we're all Israelites. I'm talking right now. I'm not talking to any of the strangers. I'm talking to the physical blood Israelites. Y'all don't have to be sitting here having this division. And no offense to the stranger, but when it comes to Israelites, why are we arguing with each other over whether the stranger, right? And I'm, I mean, arguing to the point, I mean, arguing to the point where we hate each other, right? Because the stranger, we're arguing about the stranger. So I, don't, I get to the point where, though I know that the strangers can be a part of the commonwealth of Israel, I'm not going to argue my brother down about another nationality of people. I'm trying to focus on us. I'm trying to focus on our unity. I'm trying to focus on our commonalities, right? And that's which we all should be focusing on, right? This dude is a cunning hunter living by the sword, and he hates us. So why are we fighting each other over him, right? Or over anybody, because the nations, other nations, they hate us as well, y'all. So we shouldn't be fighting over that. We shouldn't be fighting over them. Now, the people that come in, they're different than their own people because now they want to be a part of the Commonwealth of Israel. They want to be set apart from their people. So I'm not turning nobody down, right? 
Let us continue. Um, so he said, by thy sword, by thy sword shall thou live and shall serve thy brother and he shall have the dominion and you shall break his, and he shall break his yoke from off Jacob's neck. Pretty much. I'm paraphrasing. Right. So, like I said, let's go to Emelech now. Right. Let's go see Jacob. I mean, uh, Esau's lineage. We're going to second Chronicles, the first chapter. Second Chronicles, the first chapter. Second Chronicles, the first chapter, and we are going to start at verse 35. Second Chronicles, the first chapter, and we're going to start at verse 35. Verse 35 reads, the sons of Esau. Uh, Eliphaz and Ruel and Jewish and uh, Jalem, Jalem and Korah, the sons of Eliphaz, uh, Teman and Omar, Zephi or Zepho, and Gatham, Kanaz and T Timnah and Amalek. So this is who we want to focus on. Amalek, right? The Amalekites, right? Uh, we got People like the Jews that we know are Esau are more than likely Amalekites, right? His grandchild, Emelech, who's really the one who had his hand in our destruction, our, 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 our captivity, helping the other nations with our captivity, right? Emelech. Emelech. Let us go see what the Lord said about Amalek so we don't be confused about how the Lord feels about them, right? Because I'm telling y'all, people don't like bringing this stuff out. But we have a common, once again, we have a common enemy. So we should be trying to unify radicals, moderates, humble yourselves, and unify with a common enemy. Unify. Let's go to Exodus, the 17th chapter. Exodus, the 17th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 13. Exodus, the 17th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 13. Verse 13 reads, And Joshua discommit, discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Look, why is he doing that? Why is it a necessity to do that? This is going back to what the father originally did. The, the progenitor, the patriarch originally did, right? Let us keep going. 15, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nas Nisi. Jehovah Nisi. For he said, because the Lord have sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. War with Amalek from generation to generation? He's not pleased with these children, y'all. Moses made an altar. He built an altar that represented the Lord going to war with Amalek from generation to generation. Why? Because Amalek was a part of our destruction in uh, uh, the Edomite lineage, right? The main part of our destruction, right? So now let's go see. When the dominion was um the dominion was over with when it came to Esau and Israel. We're going to 2 Kings the eighth chapter. 2 Kings the eighth chapter, and we're gonna start at verse 16. 2 Kings the eighth chapter, and we are gonna start at verse 16. 
verse 16 reads, and in the fifth year of uh, Jeram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, being the king of Judah, uh, Je Je Jehoram, and son the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem, right? And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of of Ahab, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, right? Verse 19, yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David, his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him a, always a light and to his children. Verse 20, here it goes. In his days, the days of uh, 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 Jehoshaphat, in his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. So they revolted. This is how they uh, 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 broke the yoke, right? They revolted against the king of Judah, under the hand of Judah, I'm sorry, and made a king over themselves. So jo uh, Joram went over to Z Zaire and all, of the, and all of the chariots with him and he rose by night and smote the Edomites, which compassed him about. And the captains of the chariots and the people fled into their tents. Yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. Then Libna revolted at the same time. So Edom or Esau has revolted against Judah or Israel even unto this day, y'all. Even unto this day. So he's 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 against us. He's warned against us. He's revolted against us, and he, as we can see, the Lord had to uh, 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 have Moses make an altar, build an altar to represent the fact that he was going to war with Amalek from generation to generation, right? And now, in the days of Jehoshaphat, the 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 the, the Edomites revolted against Judah, made a king over themselves, and Esau revolted against Judah even unto this day. So they are against us with the sword. The cunning hunter with the sword has revolted against us. So why are we around here with this division? We already got somebody that's that, that bands together their nation bands together to revolt against us. And we're sitting here, um, we're sitting here bickering or whether he's the white man or whether he's not the white man. We know that whoever Esau is, which we, we know at this point, you got white Edomites, you about got black Edomites, right? But we know them people as far as in the land today, right? They usually, the Edomites are the ones that usually have the names of Israel, like Levi something. You know what I'm saying? They usually have some type of Hebrew name. Man. So that is who you uh, 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 specify as Esau, right? But once again, he hates both the radicals and the moderates. It doesn't matter which side you're on. It doesn't matter if you want, if you feel like Esau um, 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 can make it in the fold and can be a part of the Commonwealth of Israel. It don't matter if you don't. Guess what? The ones that, which is most of them, that ain't trying to even keep the law, statutes, commandments because they have the same mentality as their father. The ones that are not even keeping the law, statutes, commandments hate you. And you sitting here bickering about whether or not he can get in the kingdom or not. Let God be the judge of who can be in the kingdom or not. Right? You got to get yourself in the kingdom. You got to get your help your brother get in the kingdom. Right? So it doesn't make any sense to me, right? We have a common enemy that hates us and we sitting here bickering back and forth on who can get in the kingdom or not. Right? If you believe that Anybody can get in the kingdom, teach, teach them. Let them show God that 
they want to um, show him that they're faithful to him according to their works, right? You, if you believe, once again, if you believe that anybody can make it, teach them. If you don't, you're not going to do it, right? You're not going to even have a part of it. But I'm going to show both ends. For the people that uh, 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 think it's ridiculous for one side, the radicals, to hate Esau, it's not ridiculous because he hates them, right? So it's not ridiculous, right? Even though you're, the, the book says to love your enemies, right? But you can still understand it based on what, it, uh, what Esau has done to Israel, right? Revolted with the sword against his brother. So let's come together. Let's, let's try our best to come together and focus on our people coming back to the God of Israel, right? That's what we should be focused on. Uh, let us continue. Let us go to Malachi, the first chapter. Malachi, the first chapter. Malachi, the first chapter, and we're going to start at verse 1. Malachi, the first chapter, and we are going to start at verse 1. Verse 1 reads, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. That's plain as day, right? Ain't no, ain't no getting around that. I love Jacob and I hated Esau. And we're going to get into why this is, y'all, right? He said, I hated Esau and I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord have indignation forever, y'all. Right? Forever. Now, this is hand in hand because what we're going to learn is Esau's wrath on Jacob was forever. This is why the hatred of God was on Esau forever, right? This is not for no reason. He just, he not picking out Esau just to hate him. There is a logical explanation for this, right? And this also goes to show if we doing the same, um, um, if we're committing the same acts and atrocities that Esau has been committing, then we're going to be hated, as I said earlier, right? He said, this, the, the pe this is the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever, y'all, forever. That's, that's crazy. Let's keep going. Verse 5, and your eyes shall see and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel, right? Taking it back, be magnified from the border of Israel. But guess what? He going to handle Esau, right? The enemy of Israel all this time has been sneaky. He been real sneaky, right? Conspiring against you, real sneaky conspiring against you, right? Let us continue with that. Let's go to Obadiah, the first chapter. Right. And Esau got a pride on him, man. Right. We are impoverished and we will return and build the desolate cities. But you know who did this to you. Right. You know, you know, the Lord did this to you. So you got to have some type of arrogance about yourself. 
to even think you're going to build something the Lord destroyed. And he said, no, nah, you're going to build, but I'm going to throw down, right? Because I got indignation with you forever. I hate Esau. I'm at war with Amalek from generation to generation to the point that I made Moses build an altar for it. Are y'all seeing this? Y'all seeing how serious this got? Right? The Lord, the Lord ain't playing with nobody. Just like he said, I was an enemy to Israel. If you go to Lamentations, the second chapter. He said, I was an enemy unto Israel. Right? So your actions, it's your actions that make or break his love or his hatred. Right? So y'all have to understand this. This is not no carnal Oh, they're the white man, so I hate them, right? You don't know if you can blatantly say that the white man is Esau, right? Even though he's mingled with Gentiles. Yes, that is true. So you're going to see white Edomites, right? Let us continue. This is Obadiah. We're going to Obadiah. The only chapter. <laughs> Obadiah, the only chapter, and we're going to start at verse 1. So, the book of Obadiah and um, verse 1. Verse 1 reads, the vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. So now when you're looking for Esau, you have to look at some of the descriptions it says. That Esau was going to be small among the heathen and greatly despised. Right? So wherever he is, he's the small number. He's in small number. You're going to be small among the heathen and greatly despised, right? Verse 3, thy pride in thine heart hath deceived thee. And this is what this is about. The pride of Esau, his own pride, has deceived him, right? Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground, right? Because they usually dwell in in the clefts of the rocks, which is as far as their geography, right? Mount Seir was something like in the clefts of the rocks, right? But not only that, right? The This is also describing metaphorically the pride of Esau. You're dwelling in the clefts of the rocks where your habitation is high. That's, that's where your mindset is at, right? Not just where you are ge uh, uh, geographically, but this is where your mindset is at, right? And you asked in your heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? This is some arrogant mess, y'all. Arrogant, prideful. And we wonder why the Lord feels this way about Esau, right? Verse 4, thou, though thou exalted thyself as the eagle, and thou set thy nest Amongst the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Now you got one end that says that this was the white man and, and, and NASA, you know what I'm saying, going up into the stars, the moon and stuff, going up into the planets and um, 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 exalting himself as the eagle, right? The sign of the eagle, which is why you have things like Rome, uh, Greece, um, 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 in the United States, eventually down the line, they have that sign of the eagle. But we're going to see if you can say that the Greeks are Edomites or the Romans are Edomites, right? Can you actually say that wholeheartedly, even if they mingled with them? Can you say that the whole nation of Greeks and that the whole nation of Romans are Edomites, right? Because of verse four. Now y'all gotta excuse me because this, this is bringing back memories because I was, 
I was brought in the truth by the radical doctrine, right? And I had time to actually study this, analyze it, compare it, and see if this was the conclusion that I was going to stick with. It wasn't, right? This is no offense to my brothers out there. Like I said, I got people on the moderate side. I got people on the radical side that love me. You see what I'm saying? That I love right back. That we get along great. That don't mean we're going to agree on everything. Right? I want to make that clear. We're not going to agree on everything. But as long as we can come together in unity and and, 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 and iron sharpening iron once again, you tell me your side of the story. I give you my side of the story. And we come somewhere in the middle because we're not going to agree on everything. And for in some type of way, we keep the love in the unity. That's what it's about, y'all, right? To take down a common enemy, even an enemy of God who hates this nation, right? So let's not uh, be divided with this. Let's come together with this, right? Um, skip down to verse 6. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? So his hidden things, how are they searched out? Let's see some of the, excuse me. Let's see some of the hidden things that Esau is doing. Excuse me. Let's go to Psalms, the 83rd chapter. Psalms, the 83rd chapter. And we are going to start at verse 1. Psalms, the 83rd chapter, and we're going to start at verse 1. Verse 1 reads, Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. Let's see who is in the category of hating Israel that he lifted up his head against Israel, right? Verse three, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people and have consulted against thine hidden ones. Con they have conspired against you, right? That's what that means. There are conspiracies in the world, y'all, right? They have, they have consulted against thy people and they have, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people and have consulted against thy hidden ones, right? They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance for they, are con they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. Who? Is confederate against you, Israel. Verse 6, the tabernacles of Edom. The first one is Esau, who has uh, taken crafty counsel against Israel, his brother, right? Let's continue. And the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarines, uh, Gibal and Ammon and Amalek. You see how they got them separated? Because Amalek is his own entity out of Esau, right? And has done so much damage with the children of Israel, like selling us in the uh, financing, the slave trade, and all these things. This was Esau through Amalek, right? Um, the, let's continue. The Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher also is joined with them. They have hope in the children of Lot, Selah, right? So Esau is confederate against Israel, right? These are some of the hidden things because people don't know what he is doing, right? So he has, we have to be informed by the God of Israel that our brother is against us. He's wholeheartedly against us. He's wholeheartedly at war with us, right? So we got to band together to get this enemy up off of us, right? Yes, love your enemies, but don't let them consume you, right? 
Pray for your enemies, but don't let them destroy you. You see what I'm saying? We got to get this in our head. Let's go back to Obadiah. Right? Let's go back to Obadiah, the first chapter, and we're going to start at verse 8. Obadiah, the first chapter, and we're going to start at verse 8. Verse 8 reads, Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? Right? Because look what Esau is doing. Look what he's doing to his brother. We're going to get into that in this chapter too. Look what he's done or how he feels from the beginning of this about his brother. We didn't already went to war with them while we was in the wilderness with Joshua, right? And Joshua, uh, 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 Joshua sword was on Amalek, right? And once again, Moses built an altar that represented or symbolized that the Lord was going to be at war with Amalek from generation to generation. This is lasting even forever, forever, right? Verse nine, and thy mighty men, O Teman, right? We saw who Teman, Teman was a grandchild of Esau, right? Shall be dismayed to the end that everyone out of the Mount of Esau shall be cut off by slaughter. Y'all heard that, right? This is how the Lord feels about Esau. Right? So it's hard to get out of this. Right? I don't have that same spirit where I don't care who wants to come to the fold. Like I said before, I'm going to teach whoever wants to learn. I'm going to let God sort them out at the end. Right? Because I still believe that anybody can avoid the lake of fire. Right? Because only Israel has to be saved out of captivity and from their enemies. But everybody can avoid the lake of fire, y'all. You think Lord is you think the Lord wants every individual because of their nationality to burn forever? Y'all got to be out of y'all mind. Right? But you also out of your mind to uh, to not know that. The Lord hates the nation of Esau. This is a true statement, right? And you see why. We're going to get into this more. He said that they were going to be cut off by slaughter, right? Verse 10, why are they going to be cut off by slaughter? It ain't just for nothing. Why? Verse 10, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, uh, for thy violence, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee. And thou shalt be cut off forever, right? As a nation, they shall be cut off forever. Why is he saying this if he don't hate this people, right? That's why I said, any y'all look at what Esau is doing, right? And we're going to read some history with it. Y'all look at what Esau is doing, and you make sure you don't follow the same path because you're going to be hated too. Right? You want the love of God to come upon your life. Right? So this is just an example. Right? Verse 11. Now here's when it gets, this is the interesting part, when it gets tricky. Because we're going to do a, some separation here. Right? Verse 11. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou was one of them, one of them, right? One of them. So let's go and see that. We're going to get into some history now. Let's go see that. Bear with me, y'all. Let me get to this real quick. Okay. 
So we are about to go to, we are about to go to the, hold on, I'm sorry. Here we go. So we are about to read from the standard Jewish encyclopedia, uh, Cecil Roth, editor in chief of uh, editor in chief by Roth Cecil, 1899 to 1970. Publication date is 1962. So this is from this encyclopedia, and this is a description on Edom or Esau, right? So Edom or Adumia, or it's another name uh, name for Edom. Uh, a country in a country in southeast Palestine, also called Mount Seir, its terrain was uh, mountainous and easily fortified in its land and fertile. That's why it says y'all dwells in the clefts of the rocks in the mountains, right? That's what Mount Seir is, right? So, like I said, that was not only metaphorical for the description of its pride. But that's also a geographical location or description of the geographical location of where you would find Esau, right? So it says its terrain was mountainous and easily fortified and its land was fertile, right? Uh, he, lay south, he lay south of the Dead Sea and bordered on the Red Sea at, at Elath and Ezion, Geber. The Edomites were a, of Semitic origin, traditionally descendants of Esau, and lived by hunting, right? So this is what the description in the Bible says, that Esau is a cunning hunter, right? And he lives by the sword, right? Uh, we're going to keep going. They, dis, they disposed the Hurite inhabitants of Seir and organized themselves along tribal lines headed, it, headed by chieftain called Eluf, later consolidating into a monarchy. Remember when I showed y'all that they revolted against Judah and then they set a king over them? They uh, uh, created a monarchy for themselves, right? The Edomites were traditionally enemies of, Is of the Israelites, right? There's no shaking that. They are your enemies, at the end of the day, they are our enemies, right? So let's not forget that. Let's try to focus on that commonality, y'all. Let's continue. They fought Saul and were defeated by David, who partly annexed the land, right? And David also had Edomites' servants, right? So we're, we're going to... We're gonna say that as well, right? It, 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 it said that the brother was going, to, um, the elder was gonna serve the younger, right? That there were going to be Edomite servants of Israel. That is in the book, right? You can't get past that. Let us continue. The Edomites regained their independence during the reign of uh, Joram, Jehoram, right? We read that in Second Kings the eighth, uh, eighth chapter. Excuse me. But the wars between the two states were frequent, right? Because he revolted against Judah even unto this day. This is in the Jewish encyclopedia, y'all, that I'm reading from, right? So we have another witness of the Bible. Let us continue. In the 8th century BCE, the Edomites became vassals of Assyria. So for all of y'all, they were vassals or, in other words, they were servants of the Assyrians. So I'm going to ask y'all, if they were servants, if you're so sure that Esau mingled with the Romans, right, which I'm not um, denying, or you're so sure that they mingled with the Greeks, why are you not sure they mingled with the Assyrians, the Cushites? See, this is why I'm saying you can't make a blanket statement that Esau is the white man, y'all. My brothers out there, you cannot make this statement, man. Right? And if you can, like I said, I have no problem with these brothers. I have no problem with these sisters. You show me, I'm all ears, man. I'm all ears. Because it don't matter with me. 
I'm an Israelite following the law, statutes, commandments, doing my job as a priest. I'm trying to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling at the end of the day. So with us having this discussion, we ain't got to argue. We ain't got to go back and forth. You ain't got to say that you a lover of the white man. You can't even prove if he is the white man completely. Wholeheartedly, blanket statement. You can't prove that, right? Let us continue. Um, at the time of the destruction in the first temple. Uh-oh. Now, what did it say in Obadiah? It says, in the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away the captives, his forces, and the foreigners entered into the, his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was one of them, right? Let's continue. It says, at the time of the destruction of the first temple, they plundered and looted in association with the Babylonians and being driven out from Seir by the Nabataeans, occupied southern Judah during or after the period of the exile. The Edomites were conquered by John uh, Harkanus, um, who forcibly converted them to Judaism. And from then on, they co constituted a part of the Jewish people, Herod being one of their descendants. And this is from page 592 to page 593. Not only was Esau a vas vassals to the Assyrians, a black nation, you got to consider that, but they plundered and looted in association with the Babylonians, right? And also when you go down the line, they did it with the Romans as well in 70 AD, right? Let us, let's, let's, let's see that. Let us, let us go to a couple of places before we get there. Um, we are now about to read from Richard, Richard Siegel and Carl Raines edition, Identity Crisis, the Jewish Almanac, New York, uh, New York, New, New York, Bant Bantam Books, 1980, page three, right? It says, strictly speaking, it is incorrect to call an ancient Israelite a Jew or to call a contemporary Jew an Israelite or a Hebrew. This is from the Jewish Almanac, y'all. They're telling you what it is, Right? Because Esau is over there now, and then eventually, when you get down to the um to 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 our time, you got Ashkenaz over there that come from the Khazarians, right? They're Germans. That's what Ashkenaz means, Germany, right? Or German. So from the Jewish Almanac, they're say they're stating that it is incorrect to call an ancient Israelite a Jew. Right, unless he comes from the tribe of Judah or the kingdom of Judah, right, or a contemporary Jew, an Israelite or Hebrew, right. So you cannot call them that, right. So obviously our identity has been taken, y'all. Right, straight up taken, like they bogus. They are bogus. Right. Let us continue. Now we are going to the book, The 13th Drop Tribe by Arthur uh, uh, Kostler. Right. I may be pronouncing these names wrong, so bear with me and forgive me. Um, the 13th Tribe, Random House, 1967, page four. Now let's go into what I said. So eventually, right, Esau. Uh, 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 Esau is known as the Jew, but down the line, they convert the Khazarians, right? So it goes from Israel to Esau to the Khazarians. Then you had other nations that came under the banner of the Jewish people by conversion, right? But they still ain't real Israelites, 
That's the point. You have real Israelites. Now, understand this with the people out there. I, I, I want to make a side note. The people out there that say that this is not a real thing and it's a conversion. How do you explain this? How do you explain this, right? Because during the time of the Maccabees, which we're actually going to, um, we're going to go into, and the reason we're going to go into, because we are going to solidify this understanding with both sides. Remember, we're bridging the gap between the moderates and the radicals. So we're going to have to use their liter the, the literature that's used. Even if you don't subscribe to it, let's get some understanding. So when y'all have conversations with each other, y'all will know where he's co coming from, and they uh, uh, y'all will know where they're coming from, the radicals, and they will know where y'all coming from, the moderates, right? And we can come together to acknowledge that we have a common enemy, and we don't need to be bickering over nothing petty, right? So once again, this is from the 13th Tribe by Arthur Costner. Uh, uh, Random House, 1967, page four, right? The large majority of surviving Jews in the world of Eastern European, right? And thus perhaps mainly of Khazar origin. If so, this would mean that their ancestors came not from the Jordan but from the Volga, not from Canaan, but from the Caucasus, the Caucasus Mountains, right? Where you get Caucasian from, right? And that genetically, they are more closely related to the Hun, the uh, the Yurga, the Magyar tribes, than to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are Gentile tribes, right? Gentile tribes. Eventually, they become the Ashkenazi, Ashkenaz. This is a Gentile tribe, right? Now, let's deal, let's go back and deal with the fact that it says that Esau was one, one of the people, one of the nations that helped the foreigners and strangers take down Jerusalem, right? Let's go to Jeremiah. The fourth chapter. It says that they helped the Babylonians, right? They helped the Babylonians. So let's go see. Let's go see who they are. Are the Babylonians Edomites, y'all? Right? Jeremiah, the fourth chapter. You have to ask yourself, are the Babylonians Edomites? If so... Why did it say that they were one of them? Why wouldn't they put them in the same nation? See, you can't be biased when it comes to this. You have to use scholarship. You have to be humble. You have to be willing to admit that you are wrong, y'all. Right? If you see it. Or come with the facts. Don't come with your hatred. There's enough hatred already. Right? From the Lord. He can hate, he, he can hate all he wants to. He can hate Esau all he wants to, right? That's not my place to hate him. It's not my place to hate him. Even though I understand it, I can understand something and still not be my place to do it. Besides, we were already told not to hate our brother, right? We were already told not to hate our brother. Back in the law. Because some people think that's talking about Syrians. You know what I'm saying? If you go into the concordance again. That's why y'all got to watch that concordance, y'all. I use it. It's a tool. But I'm not going to use it like it's the Holy Spirit. Right? You have to make sense out of the King James Version. Right? Because this was translated from the original Hebrew. Right? So we have what we have here. And if you look at the context, it don't make sense that that's talking about a Siri, right? It doesn't, right? So we're going to continue. Uh, Jeremiah, the fourth chapter, and we're going to start at verse uh, three. Jeremiah, the fourth chapter, and we're going to start at verse three. Now, once again, 
are the Babylonians Edomites? Right? Because they are of European origin. Am I talking? And we're talking about the Neo Babylonians, not the original Babylonians, the Cushites, but the Neo Babylonians, the Gentiles under Nebuchadnezzar. I'm saying that you're Gentiles right now. Let's prove that they're Gentiles. Right? Let us continue. Verse 3 For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. So we know who we're talking about, right? And Obadiah says when they came against Jerusalem, we know we're talking to the men of Judah in Jerusalem. We also saw that the history show that Esau was looting and in association with the Babylonians. We know that the Babylonians came from Judah. So we know who we're dealing with, right? Verse 4. This is talking about Judah, right? The instructions to Judah. Verse four, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart. Ye men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my, my fury come forth like fire and burn, uh, and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense cities. Why? Because here comes Nebuchadnezzar, right? Verse six, set up the standard towards Zion, retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. The north of Israel they're talking about is Babylon, right? Right now, look what it says, and people will take this wrong, but you gotta you gotta pay attention. Verse seven: The lion is come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Now it says the destroyer of the Gentiles. I used to think that I was talking about that this person, or I think I used to think that I was talking about God is the destroyer of the Gentiles till I kept reading, right? And some of y'all probably think the same thing, but let us keep reading, right? Let's keep going. It says, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He is come. He is gone forth from his place, which place is that? From the north, to make thy land, whose land? Judah, desolate, and thy city shall be laid waste without inhabitants. When did that happen to the Gentiles at that time? You see what I'm saying? It didn't happen. Nebuchadnezzar or the Babylonians, the king of Babylon, was the destroyer and he was of the Gentiles. Just like you can be, you can be of Israel and not Israel. You can have the spirit of Christ I mean, you can be, you can have the flesh of an Israelite, but not have the spirit of the God of Israel, right? So you, you can be of Israel and not be Israel. So with this, this person was of the Gentiles, talking about Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, right? Now, guess what? Matter of fact, no, let's go to Zechariah, the first chapter. I'm going to sneak this in here. Zechariah the first chapter. We're, we're gonna we're gonna cut this up. Cause y'all y'all got to learn, like, stop being biased. Stop, stop being biased with that. Stop having that confirmation bias. Stop looking for things to support your beliefs that aren't accurate. Right? So it says that the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. The destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way, talking about Nebuchadnezzar. Let's look at this. We're going to Zechariah, the first chapter, and we're going to start at verse 18. Zechariah, the first chapter, and we're going to start at verse 18. Verse 18 reads, Then lifted I up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns, right? And I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me, 
These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, what come these, what come these to do? And he spake saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. So the four horns of the Gentiles is who? The Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. The four horn of the Gentiles, who Daniel prophesied about. The Gentile dynasty, the European dynasty, right? Let's continue. Let's go to Maccabees. Let's go to the book of Maccabees, right? What's crazy is, y'all, is that brothers will use these books, right? And of course, one side does not subscribe to them. The other side does subscribe to them, right? But you can't cherry pick your own, the, the, the literature you're using. You can't. Let's go, let's go to first Mac. Let's go to first Maccabees. We're gonna we're gonna set this up. Right? First Maccabees, the first chapter, and we're gonna start at verse 41. First Maccabees, the uh, first chapter, and we're gonna start at verse 41. Right? Verse 41 reads: Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom, Antiochus the Greek, the Helen, right? He was a Greek. Let us see what the book says the Greeks are. Now, I just showed you the four horn of the Gentiles. I just showed you that the, uh, the, 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 the destroyer of the Gentiles is Babylon. We just separated Babylon from Esau. So you, you're going to have to show how these people are just plain white folk. Now we're going we're to do this. It says, moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and everyone should leave his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath day. For the king had sent letters by messenger unto Jerusalem in the cities of Judah. We're dealing with Judah here. Right? Because the nine tribes did not deal with the Greeks. So we're not even talking about them. We're dealing with Judah. Remember in Joel, it says that the, 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 the uh, Tyree and Sidon sold Jerusalem and Judah to the who? The Grecians. This is what we're dealing with now. Right? They sold them to the Grecians, right? So the Greeks under Antiochus, they made them give up their laws, right? The Jewish, the Jewish laws or the laws of God, right? Uh, verse 44, for the king has sent letters by messenger unto Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, that they should follow the strange laws of the land. It's another thing, right? The strange laws of the land is what y'all don't follow. That's the laws of the land not to follow if they're strange. I just want to point that out, right? Let us continue. And forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice and drink offerings in the temple and that they should profane the Sabbaths and festival days and pollute the sanctuary and holy people. Set up altars and groves and chapels of idols and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts. That they should also leave their children uncircumcised and make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation, right? To the end, they might forget the law and change all the ordinances, right? And whosoever would not do according to the commandment of the king, he said he should die. Let's go confirm who these are. This is Antiochus of the Greeks, right? Let's go to 2 Maccabees. 2 Maccabees, the sixth chapter. 2 Maccabees, the sixth chapter, and we're going to start at verse 1. 
This is for people to know where the other side is getting their information from. Mind you, I don't need this to teach the word of God. So I want to throw that out there. If y'all people going to go, oh, he's teaching from the Apocrypha. No, I'm trying to get you to understand where both sides are coming from. Right? For uh, 2 Maccabees, the sixth chapter, and we're going to start at verse one. This is the chapter where they say that the lost Israelites, this is where they get the lost Israelites, are Gentiles. But if you are getting that from this, then what are the Greeks? We just showed that the four horn of the Gentiles were the same four kings in Daniel. Who are the four horns of the Gentiles that scattered Jerusalem and Judah? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greek, Rome, right? We got two different nations here now. Let's continue. Not long, verse one, not long after this, the king sent an old man to Athens to compel the Jews to depart from their the laws of their fathers and not to live after the laws of God. This is still talking about Antiochus, right? And to pollute the, also the temple in Jerusalem and to call it the temple of Jupiter Olympus. This is Zeus, right? And that in uh, Gerizim, or Jerusalem, of Jupiter, the defender of strangers, and as they did desire that dwelt in the place. Uh, let's skip down to verse, let's skip down to verse, um, no, let's continue. I'm sorry. The coming in of the mischief of the sore of the grim, grievous, uh, the coming in of, the coming in of this mischief was sore and grievous to the people. For the temple was filled with the riot and reveling by the Gentiles. Who? The Greeks. Gentiles. Not Edomites. Right? Who dallied with harlots and had to do with women within the circuit of the holy places. And besides that brought in things that were not lawful. The altar also was filled with profane things which the law forbiddeth. Neither was it lawful for a man to keep Sabbath days or ancient feast or to profess himself at all to be a Jew, right? And in the day of the king's birth, every month, they were brought by bitter constraint to eat of the sacrifices. And when the feast of Bacchus, Bacchus was kept, the Jews were compelled to go in possession of Bacchus carrying ivy. Moreover, there went out a decree to the neighbor's cities of the heathen by the suggestion of Ptolemy against the Jews that they should observe the same fashions and be partakers of their sacrifices and whoso would not conform themselves to the manner of the Gentiles should not should be put to death. Then might a man have seen the present misery. Who did they conform after? The Gentiles. I thought the Greeks was Edomites. I thought the white man was Esau. Right? Let's continue. Because that's ridiculous. When I see one side arguing this down and will sit here and say, you just trying to save Massa. But want to cherry pick on, 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 the, uh, on the literature, right? You want to cherry pick, right? Or like I said, one side, you don't want to, de you want to uh, deny as if the Lord never said that Esau, he hated Esau. And want to bicker back and forth instead of unify and come together against a common enemy, right? Let's continue. Let's go to Matthew. Now this stuff going to start making sense to y'all. Right. Let's go to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Right. So we're dealing with the pride of Esau, which is a double meaning. Once again, we dealt with the actual pride of Esau. Now we're dealing with the pride of the people that hate Esau. Now y'all going to have to deal with the fact that there is a separation between the foreigners and strangers that carry Judah away, the Gentiles, versus Esau. 
he was one of them who was associated in looting with the Babylonians, Gentiles. Right? Matthew, the 10th chapter. Matthew, the 10th chapter. And we're going to start at verse 1. Matthew, the 10th chapter. And we are going to start at verse 1. Hold on, let me get there. Let me get there. Oh. Matthew the first, uh, Matthew the 10th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 1. And verse 1 reads, And when and when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease, right? And now, and the names of the 12 apostles are these. Now watch, the mission of the 12 is different than what we're going to see with Paul, right? Watch the difference. Verse two, now these are the names of the 12 apostles are these, or now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first, Simeon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, and the son of Zeb Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Eliaphas, or Alphaeus, and Lebaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, uh, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, right? And of course, that's not a real Canaanite. He was from the area where the Canaanites dwell in Israel, in the land of Canaan, right? So these are the 12, right? Let's continue. Verse 5. These 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, now pay attention because people act like they, they, they deaf when they hear this, right? Let's read this slowly, right? Verse five, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? So if you want to call the uh, the the, the Gentile, lost Israelites Gentiles, what you're saying Jesus said was, go not into the way of the lost Israelites, but go after the lost Israelites. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. See, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm able to say this because I used to be in that mindset. You see what I'm saying? It's not saying go... Do not go to the lost Israelites, but go to the lost Israelites. The Gentiles are the children of Japheth. The Gentiles are the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Medo-Persians, the Romans. Gentiles. Gentiles. Now, he told the 12 not to go after the way of the Gentile. So when you see books like James, uh, when he's talking about this is to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, Right? Or when Peter says this is to the, the, the elect, the strangers that are scattered abroad, that's because the twi they were part of the 12. Their mission was to go after the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, let's go see what Paul's mission was. Let's go to Acts the ninth chapter. Yeah, we're going we gonna to deal with this. I love, I love both sides, but y'all going to have to deal with what it is in this book. Right? Verse 10. Acts the ninth chapter, and we're going to start at verse 10. Verse 10 reads, And there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord, to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, here am I. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul, for Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. 
and he and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight right because he lost his sight for 3 days right verse 13 then Ananias answered lord i have heard by many of this man how much evil he have done to thy saints in Jerusalem. Talking about Paul, right? Verse 14, and here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Israel. who he separated them. You got the Gentiles and the children of Israel. So he goes after the Gentiles and the children of Israel, but the 12 were told not to go in the way of the Gentiles, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You cannot confuse that. I don't care where your mind want to take you. You can't confuse that. Paul was supposed to if you go to Galatians, the second chapter, I know brothers want to go into the second Ezra to talk about Israel being a heathen. But if you're going to say Israel can be a spiritual heathen, then the heathen can be a spiritual Israelite. Let's not play around with semantics, y'all. Right? Paul and Barnabas went to the heathen. And the 12, Peter, James, John, they went to the circumcision. They had two different missions, right? But it was to bring all the daughters, sons and daughters of Adam back to the commonwealth of Israel, right? This is, this is what's going on. Now, I just wanted to deal with that. We're not going to take a long time. Uh, we're not going to take that much time on that. Let's get back to Esau. Let's go to Amos, the first chapter. And we got one more place after this. Amos, the first chapter. Amos, the first chapter, and we're going to start at verse 11. Amos, the first chapter, and we're going to start at verse 11. Verse 11 reads, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because he did pursue his brother with the sword and did cast off all pity and his anger did tear perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. This is why the nation of Esau is going to be cut off forever, forever, because the wrath, but, uh, uh, because his pursuit and his wrath for the nation of Israel was forever. Doesn't that make sense, y'all? That makes sense because they hated and had their wrath on the chosen people forever. Therefore, the God of Israel hates them forever. So they did that. Then he sold his birthright for some soup. You see what I'm saying? He despised his birthright and despised the children of the God of Israel, which is Jacob and his descendants, right? This is why the Lord feels this way. And he is a common enemy to both of us, right? Let's keep going. Verse 12, but I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Bozrah. So it's a constant destruction of Esau and the nation of Esau. Constant war, constant destruction, constantly being reminded how the Lord hates Esau. Right? Constant reminder. So we can't turn an ear towards that. Right? Israelites have to come together, right? Eventually, y'all, my, my brothers on the radical end, y'all may not like this, but eventually you're going to have to come into the realization that if you see a stranger, right? Not even talking about Esau, but once again, individually, I'm not turning nobody down. 
But when you see a stranger and they want to be a part of the commonwealth of Israel, you can't turn your nose at them. You got to do your job as the priest, right? Now, I just pointed this out. Now, watch somebody, watch somebody misconstrue this message. I'm already putting this out there. Watch how somebody misconstrue this message, right? This is to bridge the gap. And if you ain't part of that unifying, then you wasting your time, right? What are you doing this for, right? Ain't we supposed to come together in unity, right? As best as we can, because we already know that two thirds of Israel is going to, is not going to make it, right? But that remnant, that one third, I'm talking to the one third. Y'all going to eventually have to come dead smack in the middle. <gasps> Excuse me. Dead smack in the middle, right? Eventually. Now, this is exactly why going on the radical side. This is why it can be confusing. This is why it can be understandable to think that it's over with for Esau. Even the individuals. It's understandable, y'all. Right? Because, but the context, the, the context is, the context is Somebody wants to be a part of the commonwealth of Israel. You teach them. You let God decide what's going to happen in them. It's not your place to decide what's going to happen in them because in all actuality, the Lord has mercy on who he has mercy on. Right? So you can't tell nobody as an individual that they can't make it. That they can't avoid the lake of fire. You can't tell nobody that. Last place, Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Now, y'all see how I'm being balanced on both sides? This is where what which we should aim to be, balanced on both sides. Balanced. Understand that we have a common enemy, but let's not get besides ourselves about who that enemy is, right? So we're going to go to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 14. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 14. Verse 14 reads, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail to the of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat, so his birthright. One morsel of meat, y'all. That still trips me out. You did you hated. He had to hate God. Think about that. He had to hate God. If you gonna, if you're gonna sell the birthright for one morsel of meat, my man. Come on now. You hate God. You hate him. Right? Let's continue. Verse 17. For ye know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He found no place of repentance. I'm going to leave it at that. Because the book says what it says, y'all. It says what it says. Right? He found no place of repentance, even though he sought it carefully with tears. He, he found no place of repentance, right? So this is what I wanted to bring out, right? This was not to offend nobody. This, was, this wasn't even to cut nobody, right? This is to correct some things that need to be correct and to understand some things that need to be understood so that we could understand both parts of the spectrum. That when you come to a radical or when you come to a moderate, you respect their understanding and you try your best to give your side of it, 
But at the end of the day, we are all Israelites. So why are we sitting here? No offense to the strangers, y'all. But why are we sitting here fighting over their salvation? Why? We are all Israelites. Like all Israelites be at the table, we're going to sit here and bicker and argue whether they can be saved or not. Right? Right? Regardless of what you believe in, understand that you have a common enemy. Understand that eventually everybody's going to have to meet in the middle and you cannot take your biases or your pride with you. Once again, all praises to the Most High God, the Elohim of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who is Jesus. And I thank you for your time. Shalom, shalom.